Good morning again. We all know this is a big week with a lot at stake. But today we're going to take a step back from that and take a look at a bigger picture into our past as a country and how our past and Episcopal's, uh, our country's past and Episcopal's past have crossed paths. And today we constantly remind students that we are part of something bigger than ourselves. And today's story from Mr. Forbes will actually bring that story home a little bit in terms of the idea of legacy. And what does it mean in terms of John's gospel to be willing to lay down one's life? <laughs> Gotta love lower school. On a more serious note, to lay down one's life for a friend. And you'll hear a story about that today and that type of legacy. At this time, I invite you to stand as you are able to welcome Mr. Forbes. Good morning, please. Good morning. Please be seated. So I do have to apologize to uh, the rising ninth graders because they heard this or a rendition of this uh, last year. Um, so first I would like to thank Reverend Gavin, Dr. Locke, and Mr. Letts for giving me the chance to talk to you today. It is my distinct honor and privilege to stand before you to talk about something that is very much a part of our Episcopal family as much as it is a part of my family, and that is Veterans Day. It is, it is a day that our country honors its sons and daughters that have served in the United States Armed Forces. What you may not know is that there are thousands of alumni throughout the history of this school that have served our country in the Armed Forces. Around 350 are still living today. As you well know, Episcopal Academy has been around since 1785. So that is less than 10 years after the United States' birth as a country. So it is safe to say, except for the Revolutionary War, Episcopal students have been involved with every conflict of these United States. There are a number of faculty and staff here on campus that have also served. You will have a chance to recognize our own veterans at the Edward H. Vick Jr. Veterans Day Chapel on Tuesday. But I come before you today to talk about one Episcopal Academy veteran specifically. His name is Francis Cox Forbes. He passed away a few years ago at the age of 98. Some of you may have seen his name before, <clears throat> excuse me, for it is his name that is inscribed on the very cross that some of you may have carried to usher the student body into chapel when you were in middle school. I am here today to tell you about the story of his service to our country and the history of this cross. I will also talk about the lower school cross. Both crosses remain in service to the Episcopal Academy to this day. Let's see if we can... Let's help if it's on. That one. So almost 100 years ago, in 1913, Webster's Dictionary defined the word hero as a man of distinguished valor, enterprise and danger, or fortitude in suffering. It all begins over 100 years ago, in the year 1918, in the sleepy town of Villanova. A baby boy was born in a house that was three doors down from the trolley station across from Villanova College. That's right. You're familiar with what it's called today. He was the second-born son of Colonel William Ennis Forbes and Daisy Cox Wright Forbes. His name is Francis Cox Forbes, and he was my great uncle. I always knew him as Uncle Frank. And now it turns out that Uncle Frank is one of you. He had attended Episcopal Academy up until eighth grade and then went on to St. George's School in Newport, Rhode Island to graduate in 1937. He graduated in January of 41 from the University of Pennsylvania. At this time, the United States was not officially at war, but all of Europe was and all indicators were pointing to the U.S. entering the war at some point in the near future. December 7th of that year, the U.S. was attacked by the Empire of Japan at Pearl Harbor. Shortly thereafter, the U.S. officially entered the Second World War. Uncle Frank joined the military in January of 1942. He had always been fascinated with flying, so when he joined the military, he joined the U.S. Army Air Corps. He was stationed at a number of bases in Florida and Alabama to learn how to be a fighter pilot. He graduated from flight school in September of 1942 
and went to Sarasota, Florida to fly Bell P-39 Air Cobras until December. After receiving his pilot's rating in the Curtis P-40 Warhawk, he got his orders transferring him to the newly formed 14th Air Force. Claire Chenault had been commissioned as a Brigadier General to take command of this unit. Some of you may have heard of this unit before. Ben Affleck and Josh Hartnett played pilots in the movie Pearl Harbor as members of the AVG, which is the American Volunteer Group. They became known as the Flying Tigers. Uncle Frank arrived at his unit, the base's operation, in Yunyan Yi, China, in the beginning of September 1943. It's okay, I had no idea where it was either, so I did what everybody else does, and I googled it. It turns out that Yunyan Yi is a spot on a map about 140 miles northwest of Kunming in southwestern China. It is literally halfway around the world. Here's an excerpt of an interview I recorded with Uncle Frank. It was October and the rice was ripe for harvesting and the Japanese wanted to feed their troops and we were ordered to try and stop them. The Japanese, you see, wanted the rice. They did not want the land or anything like that. They wanted the rice and we tried to stop them, but we couldn't. They just kept coming. It was in the area of southwestern China around the Salween River that was sort of a dividing line between the Japanese Imperial Army and the Chinese nationalists. Our mission was to dive bomb these Japanese troop concentrations trying to take, rice, take the rice harvest. During one of these bombing runs is when they shot two of us down. We had taken off from Yunyan Yi at 11 a.m. on the morning of October 17th. Our target was Liu Q. I was the last plane of four in a line to make strafing runs and drop bombs on the enemy units. As we commenced our bombing run, I had dropped all of my bombs and then boom, I was hit. Another pilot ahead of me, he got hit too, but his plane just sort of disappeared. Don't know what happened to him. A fellow named Jackson. The other two planes between us made it through without getting hit. The other two pilots in the sortie saw me go in, so they circled around and saw my parachute on the ground. They circled around again, and the parachute was gone. They then made it back to their base, or back to Union Yi, and reported what they had seen. Now, on October 22, 1943, halfway around the world in Villanova, PA, there came a Western Union telegram. <laughs> For those of you who don't know what a telegram is, think of it as a very, very, very slow text message. Frank's mother went down to the station to pick it up. If you look up on the screen, this is what it said. Colonel William Ennis Forbes, the Secretary of War desires me to express his regret that your son, 2nd Lieutenant Francis C. Forbes, has been reported missing in action since 17 October in Asiatic area. If further details or other information are received, you will be promptly notified. Imagine going down to the Western Union Station to find out your son was missing in action. Uh, it's, it's unbelievable. In the days after receiving this heartbreaking news, his mother, my great-grandmother, decided to memorialize her son's memory by commissioning a cross to be given to the Episcopal Academy in his honor with the following inscription. You guys can read it. It says, In memoriam dierum, in love and memory, October 17th through 21st, 1943, Lieutenant Francis Cox Forbes, United States Army Air Forces. This in itself would be a proper place to end this story. <laughs> but it's not finished yet. The family received another telegram on 11 November 1943. And it read, Colonel William Ennis Forbes, is that the right one? Second one, yeah. Uh, corrected report received states your son, Second Lieutenant Francis C. Forbes, was seriously injured in action 17 October in the Asiatic area and not missing in action as previously reported. You will be advised as reports of conditions are received. Now, again, halfway around the world, you're getting a piece of paper in the mail telling you now that your son is alive. I mean, it's, it's a whole different world. You see, even though we, everyone feared the worst, they came to find out three weeks later to quote Mark Twain, the report of my death was an exaggeration. Uncle Frank was shot down, but he did not pay the ultimate sacrifice. He had survived. And here is the rest of his story in his words. So I had to get out of the airplane because I had been hit and was losing altitude fast. I had an oxygen mask on, so when I was engulfed in flames, I inhaled violently. With the oxygen mask on, this saved me from inhaling all of the flames and hot gas, which would have killed me right away. I was not dead. So my training took over. I pulled my ripcord out of my seat and I started to climb out. When I finally got out of the cockpit and jumped clear of the plane. As an aside, there, were, there, there are no ejection seats in this aircraft. So you physically have to exit the aircraft however you could get out. So then I was falling. So the thing I had to do was pull my ripcord on my chute. So I pulled it and the parachute opened. We had a graveyard joke in the unit was if your parachute doesn't open, then the army will issue a new one for free. 
So anyway, it was, turns out that it wasn't all that funny a joke. I had no idea where I was going to land, and I had landed in the only place I could have landed safely without being immediately captured. I had no control of that whatsoever. It sort of just went down that way. It was a sandy little beach in the middle of the Salween River. We had a standing technical orders on survival, and they had stated not to try to cross the Salween River because you will likely drown. I said to myself, this is an exception. It was sort of a little sandy beach into the, went into the river, and I was able to get out of my harness, and I ran towards the Salween River. You see, I was going to swim it. I had ditched my sidearm because the last thing I wanted to do was get in a firefight, and the weight would probably just drag me down. I had my clothes and my standard-issue personal Bible with me, and I got into the river. One reason why I was able to survive was because the summer of 43, there was a drought, so all the big rivers ran about 6 to 10 feet lower than normal in October. Another reason that was that my plane had crashed in the river upstream and completely sank except for the oxygen tank, which had shaken loose from the back of the seat in the rear of the fuselage. It had come floating down the river, so I grabbed a hold of it, put the tube in my mouth, and ducked under the water. You see, the Japanese would be looking for me at the crash location, so I went under and floated downstream beyond where I was thought they may be looking for me. I was, going, I was holding onto the strap for flotation. I had gotten in, in some white water rapids and such, and if I hadn't had it, I would have drowned. So I made it to the shore downstream, but on the Japanese side of the river. I sort of flopped down on the bank, and I shook for a long time. I asked him if he knew about what was reported to be happening to other U.S. servicemen who were captured. Was that in any part in his consciousness or thinking at the time? He said, yes, most definitely. I knew all about it. We had a pilot we flew with who had lost his motor in his P-40, and he made it safely out and out of the ground where he was captured. What happened next shook all of us. He was tortured, and then he was killed. And then they sent his body back to our command post as a warning. At the time when we saw it, I told myself that was terrible. Poor chap. It couldn't happen to me. Didn't bother me at all. Couldn't happen to me. And then you see, it did. I stayed on the banks of the river until I had regained control, and I was able to get up and hop into a drainage ditch of a rice paddy. You see, all those rice was ready for harvesting, and the farmers had drained the water. So I hopped in there and stayed in there for the rest of the day. I then asked him, you said you had your standard issue Bible with you. And he said, I did have it with me, but I wasn't able to use my hands. My gloves had burned to my hands, and they were dreadfully sore. But one thing about it is that I was in a valley, and I rem remembered my psalms, and I repeated them to myself. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall not fear, for thou art with me. And that had an important part in my situation. It gave me the courage and the strength to get moving. So the next day I started to walk around the area looking for Chinese guerrillas because it was rumored that there were a number of such units on this side of the river. I was on the Japanese side of the river for about four days. I did not see any Japanese officers or soldiers until the last day. I had come across a ravine that was too wide to jump across. And the only reason why I went up the one side was that a herd of those Filipino buffaloes were coming at me in a hostile way and made me go up there earlier than I wanted to. As I got to the crest, I looked across the ravine to see a Japanese officer in a pointy hat with a pistol and a leather belt and a samurai sword glaring at me. There were two enlisted soldiers, soldiers with him and that he meant, motioned to them to come and get me. They started running down their side of the ravine. I believe what saved me here was at this point I remembered how to backtrack from my beagling days at the Radnor Hunt just down the road. So I went back over my trail, most of the ravine, crossed a creek, and then took off through some wheat fields that were tall enough to hide me. I never saw them again. I spent a very uncomfortable night by the river, so I figured it was time to get across. I got three of those bamboo poles that were floating as flotsam and put them together. I tucked them underneath my arms and then kicked my way across the river. I had to get across fairly soon because there was white water downstream. After I got across, I climbed the boulders on the other side very slowly, expecting the Japanese to appear on the opposite side of the river to take shots at me, but they didn't do it. So I got onto this path, came down the river, and I walked up to it, and there was a little house of sticks. I sat down in front of that, and I went sound asleep. I was awakened by two soldiers wearing the insignia of the Nationalist Army, and I knew I was in Chinese hands at this point in time. There was a Chinese captain with them who could speak English, so I talked to him for a little while, and he asked me if I could walk. I said no. So they carried me on a litter for three days until Dr. Toms, a British Quaker surgeon who was in China providing medical services to soldiers and peasants, met us on the trail. He had them carry me back to the village that he was staying in and patch me up as best he could. They tried to get me to walk, but I was too weak to walk because I had lost an awful lot of weight over the past couple of days. We left at first light from his village to get down to the Burma Road to meet up with U.S. forces. They were supposed to meet us there at midday, but when we got there, they weren't there. They turned up a little while later. When we asked where they were, they said, that you didn't see the zeros that strafed the area? We said no, but as it turns out, we had avoided being seen because we left at first light, and if they would have seen us, that would have been the end of us. 
Now, Colonel King, an American Air Force flight surgeon, met us at the rendezvous point on the Burma Road in the Medical Service Corps Ambulance, and they packed me up and got me back to Yunyan Yi. They then got me on a DC-2 airplane to Kunming. In Kunming, they had to operate on my eye because of some damage that I had sustained in the crash. The sur this surgery enabled me to fly again. If that surgeon hadn't been there, I probably would have lost my eye and never been able to fly again. After a couple of days, I was moved to Assam, India for Christmas of 43. From there, I was moved to Calcutta for about a month, and finally on to West Palm Beach, Florida for the remainder of my convalescent leave. So in early 1944, Uncle Frank was reunited with my great-grandmother in Florida while he was recovering from the wounds received during this incredible ordeal. In 1946, my great-grandmother passed away from complications during a surgical procedure. In her memory, our family donated another cross to the Episcopal Academy with the following inscription. Let me go this way. To the glory of God and loving memory of Daisy Cox Wright Forbes, 8-19-88-7-17-46. So for the past 75 years, these crosses have been serving the Episcopal Academy and its students. Now, Uncle Frank had signed up to make a difference, to fight in defense of our country. He signed up because he believed it was the right thing to do. To sum it up, Uncle Frank was a true veteran. He came to the Episcopal Academy Veterans Day Chapel with me for the last 10 years of his life. When asked how he was doing, his response was always, better for seeing you. He was a humble hero. He was a gentleman scholar. He was old school. And he was our school. He had a number of things go his way during his epic ordeal I just told you about. My advice to you is this. If you're ever asked to go beagling, like he asked me to do back in 1996, you might want to think about doing it, because it might just save your life. It's these experiences of your life and faith that help you overcome adversity in ways you'd never imagine. Now you will all leave here this morning to continue your own journeys and hopefully grow from these experiences yet to come. During these journeys, please take a moment to reflect, and you'll hopefully come to realize that even though you will eventually leave our halls here at EA to pursue your dreams, these halls never really leave you. They never left Uncle Frank. And hopefully, may they never leave you also. I appreciate you all giving me the chance to talk to you today. Thank you for your time. In silence, let us reflect on what we just heard.